My name is Andy Gilbert, and my co-authors and I work for the Illinois Natural History Survey at the Forbes Biological Station. We have monitored the vegetation community at Immaquan since the start of the restoration, and today I'm going to discuss how it has changed over time. Additionally, I will also discuss how waterfowl and waterbird use has changed at Immaquan throughout this time as well. I'm going to start off with a bit of history about the Illinois River Valley. Historically, the IRV provided extensive and valuable habitat to migratory waterbirds and other wetland-dependent wildlife. The IRV had many backwater lakes and tributaries, which were rich in aquatic vegetation. These vegetation communities often included dense patches of aquatic plants, such as pond weeds, American lotus, many different species of annual and perennial grasses, and even water celery. Unfortunately, extensive levying and drainage has eliminated many of these natural wetlands and it has drastically degraded hydrology of the remaining wetlands. Despite the loss and degradation of these important wetlands, the IRV remains an important resource for migratory birds in the region. Fortunately, the Upper Mississippi River and Great Lakes joint venture has made the IRV a priority in restoration, and restoration and reclamation efforts are ongoing to return structure and function to backwater lakes and wetlands in the region. One of the most substantial efforts is the Nature Conservancy's Immaquan Preserve, directly restoring, enhancing, and protecting more than 2,700 hectares of former wetlands and uplands in the central IRV. For our wetland monitoring, we mapped all wetland vegetation communities, mudflats, and areas containing surface water at Immaquan during the autumn. We delineated vegetation communities and other cover types using handheld field PCs and digitized cover types in ArcGIS using field notes and GPS waypoints overlaid on high-res aerial imagery. With this data, we have created yearly vegetation cover maps of the wetland basin at Immaquan. Within the first few years of the restoration, we observed submerged aquatic vegetation and hemi marsh habitats across much of the wetland. Starting around 2012, we began to observe some signs that the wetland was entering the degenerating marsh stage. Over the next few years, we began to see a reduction in the amount of persistent emergent vegetation and hemi marsh habitats, and the amount of open water began to increase. In more recent years, TNC has conducted yearly drawdowns of the wetland. From year to year, the intensity of the drawdowns have varied. During years of less intense drawdowns, like 2019, we still observed much of the wetland basin covered with submerged aquatic vegetation. In years where a more intensive drawdown was conducted, like in 2020 and 2021, a greater amount of water was removed from the wetland and we observed more production of non-persistent emergent vegetation. Additionally, during these drawdowns, we have seen a decrease in the amount of submerged aquatic vegetation across the preserve. Uh, but to some extent, this was expected. Uh, with less water on the landscape, there was less area available for these submerged aquatic plants to grow. However, over the last couple of years, there has been a further reduction of submerged aquatic vegetation at Immaquan. In 2022, a drawdown was not conducted and water levels remained higher, and we would have expected submerged aquatics to rebound at Immaquan, but we did not observe that. Generally, we only observed submerged aquatics around the perimeter of the wetland in areas where the water was only a few inches deep, and in some of the ditches. And due to a rather dry summer and fall, much of the area that had submerged aquatics eventually dried and the vegetation was left on mudflats by late September. Each year that we cover map at Emaquan, we calculate the area that is composed of each habitat type. Here we have a graph of the percent of the wetland that was composed of aquatic bed habitat throughout the years. As expected, during the years of the drawdowns in 2018, 2020, 2021, we see a reduction in the amount of aquatic bed across Emaquan. However, this graph again illustrates that in 2022, we did not see a rebound of aquatic bed habitat that we would have expected uh, when the water was not drawn down. However, during 2023, we did observe a bit of an increase in the amount of aquatic bed at Emaquan. Last year, we had similar dry conditions during the summer like that of 2022. 
These dry conditions cause a bit of a natural drawdown, which exposed larger amounts of shallowly flooded water, and by late summer, aquatic vegetation was present in these areas. However, unlike 2022, we got a bit of precipitation in early fall 2023, and that aquatic vegetation remained flooded. This resulted in the increase in aquatic bed that we observed and mapped in 2023. In addition to cover mapping habitat types at Emmaquan, we also conduct several projects monitoring waterbird and waterfowl use of Emmaquan. To assess waterfowl and waterbird use at Emmaquan, we conduct aerial surveys. These surveys are part of our long-term monitoring project that has been conducting aerial waterfowl surveys of the Illinois and Central Mississippi rivers since 1948. These surveys are flown weekly during spring and fall, and we count all waterfowl species as well as American coot, cormorants, pelicans, and eagles. We use the counts collected during our aerial surveys to calculate use days. And use days are an estimate of how many birds use Emmaquan over the survey period. So, in a very simplified example, if 10 ducks used Emmaquan for 10 days, 10 ducks times 10 days, that would uh, be 100 use days. Uh, so, I'll start here uh, with our fall use days. Uh, the four species groups that I have included here are dabbling ducks, non-mallard dabbling ducks, diving ducks, and American coot. Uh, these graphs show use days on a yearly basis, and the number above each bar is the percentage of use days for the entire Illinois River Valley that were at Immaquan. And as you can see, we observed a peak in use days early on in the restoration, somewhere around 2009 to 2011, and then a general decrease in use days since then for all of these species groups. Now, there are a lot of factors that play into which wetlands, waterfowl, and waterbirds choose to use during their migration, and many of these factors likely play into these birds' decisions, uh, but very high on that list is the amount of food resources that are available at a wetland. And if we look back at the aquatic bed through the years, we see a very similar trend. Aquatic bed peaked early on in the restoration and has declined since then. Aquatic bed habitats can be very rich and diverse food resources for waterfowl and other waterbirds. Uh, some species, such as gadwall, widgeon, and coot, specialize on foraging on submerged aquatic vegetation. But along with foraging on the actual plants, uh, these habitats can host a very diverse aquatic invertebrate community, and these plants produce seeds which are also consumed uh, by waterfowl. So it's likely that, that the decline in waterfowl use at Immaquan is at least in part influenced by the decline in aquatic bed habitats. A species where this seems very apparent is the American coot. Like I said, coot are aquatic vegetation specialists, and it makes up a large portion of their diet. At different times throughout the restoration, upwards of 80 to 90 percent of coot in the Illinois River Valley were found at Immaquan. But over the past couple of years, that percentage has dropped to about 5 percent. With the increase in aquatic bed coverage in 2023, we did observe a slight increase of American coot use days. However, aquatic bed coverage increased by about 200 percent from 2022 to 2023, but American coot use days only increased by about 60%. When we look at spring use days, we see more variation in the trends of the different species groups. Some are increasing while others are decreasing or staying more level. Here, aquatic bed habitats likely play less of a role in spring as they do in the fall. Much of spring migration uh, for waterfowl occurs before these aquatic plants begin to grow, so it's likely that other factors are the primary drivers of waterfowl use in the spring. Our other monitoring focus is waterbird production. To monitor waterbird production, we conduct secretive marsh bird nest monitoring and brood surveys. And we can use these findings and trends from these monitoring projects to assess how restoration efforts and management actions have affected waterbird production at Immaquan. Uh, we've conducted secretive marsh bird nest monitoring at Immaquan since 2013. In general, this project is a bit more closely tied to the persistent emergent and hemi marsh habitats throughout Immaquan. Uh, but several of the secret marsh bird species that we monitor and their broods also consume submerged aquatic vegetation or the aquatic invertebrates that are present within this vegetation. 
Uh, for this project, we randomly select locations uh, within persistent emergent or hemi marsh habitats and search a 25 meter buffer around each location. And any marsh bird nests that are located within these plots are then monitored weekly until they hatch to determine nest success. Over the 11 years of this project, we have searched 860 random plots and have found 648 active water bird nests. The most commonly found nests were from common gallinules, least bitterns, black crowned night herons, and American coot. Generally, over the past decade, nest survival has seemed to vary a bit from year to year, but has averaged around 33% overall. For our two most commonly nesting water birds, the least bittern and common gallinule, nest survival has averaged around 32% for common gallinules, and a bit higher at 49% for least bitterns. As for nest abundance in Immaquan, we observed a peak in nest abundance around 2017, and then a gradual decrease in nest abundance thereafter. And this decrease in the number of marsh bird nests at Immaquan may be in part due to the amount of available nesting habitat. As you can see from the map on the left, over the years, marsh birds have nested widely across Immaquan. But in recent years, the majority of marsh birds have nested in a relatively smaller portion in Central Flag Lake. And in 2023, the only active nests that we located were in this area. We did find nests in other portions of the wetland, but they were abandoned and the nests were never finished. Much of the other marsh bird nesting habitat at Immaquan is in much shallower areas around the perimeter of the wetland. And with the dry summers that we've been having, these areas appear to soon become unsuitable for marsh bird nesting due to receding water levels. Uh, the two species that are most dependent on submerged aquatics are likely the American coot and the pied-billed grebe. Uh, for American coot, a large portion of their diet is composed of submerged aquatic vegetation. Uh, American coot were one of our most common nesting secret of marsh birds during the first five years of monitoring. Uh, but since the start of the drawdowns in 2018, we have only documented four American coot nests at Immaquan. As for pied-billed grebes, grebes generally construct their floating nests of submerged aquatic vegetation. Overall, we have found a lot less of their nests compared to coot throughout the years, uh, but we have not documented a pied-billed grebe nest at Immaquan after the drawdowns began in 2018. In addition to nest monitoring, we also conduct brood surveys to monitor water bird nesting at Immaquan. Since 2008, we've conducted bi-weekly brood surveys at four locations across Immaquan from May through August. Our surveys begin at sunrise and we scan wetland habitat using spotting scopes or binoculars to find and identify water bird broods. We use the data we collect to calculate brood density across Immaquan that can be used as an index from year to year to monitor water bird production. Over the 16 years of this survey, we have documented 1,895 broods of 12 different water bird species at Immaquan. The most common broods observed across this time period were wood ducks, Canada geese, and mute swans. For the most commonly detected waterfowl species, Brood observations and density peaked between 2017 and 2019. Since then, we have seen a decline in brood observations and brood density for these species. This decline occurred around the same time as the wetland drawdowns and decline in aquatic bed at Immaquan. Invertebrate communities within aquatic bed habitats provide an important food source for broods. And the decline of this habitat type is likely a contributing factor to the decline of broods at Immaquan. Although we have seen declines in broods, brood density at Immaquan remains greater than or similar to, to that of previously published estimates to other wetlands within the Midwest. Brood observations for non waterfall water birds at Immaquan tend to be much less common. For even the most common water bird breeders, Total yearly brood observations were rarely greater than 5 to 10 broods for these species. Trends of brood abundance for these species are difficult to assess with such sporadic detection. However, brood abundances appear to be declining for many of these species as well. Fluctuations in emergent vegetation communities may explain some of the variability in observations of these species. 
Waterbird broods, especially American Coot and Common Gallinule, tend to be very secretive and seek dense cover for safety, which makes detection through passive brood surveys difficult. Alright, so I've gotten to the portion of the presentation where we reflect on what we have learned and look forward to the future. And it feels like much of what I've presented so far has been doom and gloom for wetland habitat and water birds at Imaquan over the past several years. But that's not necessarily the case. Wetlands do naturally go through cycles in vegetation communities, and this can drastically influence water bird use and production. Additionally, conditions of the surrounding landscape can also influence water bird numbers and distributions. The same dry conditions that have influenced Imaquan have also helped other wetlands in the area produce large amounts of moist soil vegetation and food for water birds over the past few years. This surplus of food on the surrounding landscape likely played a role in water bird distributions across the region. This illustrates why it's important that land managers cooperate to provide varied food and wildlife habitat across the region because Imaquan is just a piece of the wildlife habitat puzzle in our region. However though, without some sort of positive change in the vegetation community at Imaquan, it is unlikely that we will see the levels of water bird numbers and production that we have observed in the past at Imaquan. But I think TNC is doing a good job of trying to tease apart and understand these changes to the wetland and to develop a wetland management plan for the future. Uh, with that, I would like to thank all of our partners who have helped with this research and thank TNC for allowing us to conduct research on their property. If there are any questions, I would be happy to answer them.